isn't meant to be condemnation, legalism, or law. It's meant to be life. If I had to liken it to uh, something, it'd be more like a spiritual pep talk. You know how a coach, the season's culminating, the game's on the line, and the coach, man, at halftime, he gets the team in, and he says, now, guys, listen, I need you to remember this, 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 and this, right? Watch out for that. Now, get out there, play strong, let's finish strong, let's win the game. That's the spirit in which this message is, is given, and I hope you'll receive it that way this morning. I want to talk to you about the coming reward, the coming reward. You know, throughout my uh, tenure as a minister, I've had the opportunity of being a, a commencement speaker at various Bible school graduations, commencement services, both uh, here in America and abroad. And of course, uh, we were gathered in those times to acknowledge and to reward individuals for their academic accomplishments. But many times as I stood before uh, those students, cognizant of the fact they were about to receive a diploma, I would often reflect upon the reality that one day, and I believe one day soon, every single one of us will stand before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who will at that time acknowledge and reward all of those who have been faithful to serve Him and to carry out uh, His kingdom purposes in the earth. I think it's vitally important that we understand and assess and uh, very soberly and attentively so the times in which we're living. How quickly this dispensation is culminating and why we do what we do and why we live as we live uh, like Christians in the family of God. The Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, notice he said, The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Man, that is a day that I am looking forward to. It's a day that I've anticipated with great joy since I was a small child. About seven years old, I was born again in a Baptist church. I used to jump up and down. I'd say, Mom and Dad, wouldn't it be awesome if Jesus came today? And I still feel that way, and I'm anticipating it. So not only is Jesus coming to catch away this glorious church to ultimately bind Satan, restore righteousness and justice in the earth, but the Bible says when He comes, He's bringing something with Him. Revelation chapter 22, verses 12 through 14. Notice the words of Jesus, Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to His work. I'm the Alpha, I'm the Omega, I'm the beginning, the end, the first, the last. Blessed are those that do His commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. As I said, you know, that's a day that I'm looking forward to, and it's one that I think should be a constant source of reflection in the hearts and the minds of every Christian. That immediately following the catching away of the church will be what we term the great tribunal of the church. Uh, the scripture terms it more specifically the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I realize that the word judgment has a tendency to make people nervous. But the judgment seat of Christ has nothing to do with one's salvation. It will not be the time or place where your destination, heaven or hell, is determined. That will have been predetermined while in the body, on the earth, through personal of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the judgment seat of Christ isn't to be confused with the great white throne judgment that occurs at the consummation of the millennial rule and reign and is reserved uh, specifically for the wicked dead. But the judgment seat of Christ is exclusively for you and for me believers. And it is the time and place where our works, our deeds, our actions as Christians will be evaluated 
and we will be rewarded accordingly. I mean, people get excited. I don't, but people in the world get excited about the Emmy Awards, the Grammy Awards, the Tony Awards, the Oscars, you know. And, of course, those are ceremonies where people are acknowledged and rewarded, so to speak, for their areas of artistic ability, music, singing, script, theater, and so forth. Uh, Acting. How many of you know you and I are going to get a reward for acting also? Acting like the Bible was true and living our lives in accordance with it because it is. Listen, their reward is earthly and temporary. Yours and mine is eternal. Their walk down that red carpet will pale in comparison to our walk down the streets of gold with a crown of righteousness on our head. Paul speaks of this occasion several places in the New Testament, one of which is in 2 Corinthians 5.10. And notice what he said. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. So the reality is, once again, every single one of us will appear before this judgment seat of Christ and we will give an account of our lives while in the body and the works that we've done. And at that moment, when I am looking at him face to face, and you likewise, what others thought about my words or my deeds will be of no consequence. It will be expressly his thoughts and his judgment that matters. It won't necessarily matter how many trophies I had on the shelf, what kind of clothes I wore, house I lived in, or car I drove, or how much money I had in the bank. Although we understand it isn't an infraction against kingdom living to have and enjoy those things. But at that moment... The only considerations will be, did I please you? Did I obey you? Did I apprehend the things that you apprehended me for? Did I run the race that you marked out for me to run? Or did I pursue my own agenda, my own comfort, my own pleasure? Was I kind to others? Did I serve you and others with a willing heart? Did I reach the high calling of God in Christ Jesus? Did I love my neighbor as I love myself? Did I love you with all of my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength? These are the kinds of questions we're going to be rehearsing at that moment. And the only way that you and I will be able to answer those questions with an affirmative yes is if we live our lives now with a clear sense of purpose and direction and run this earthly race with an eternal perspective. It's so easy to become consumed with our natural life, isn't it? To be preoccupied, particularly now with all the voices and the commotion that is in this present world. And forget what this life and our journey through this life is really all about. The Bible likens our our life in Christ to a race that we're running. It isn't a sprint. It's not the long jump. It's a marathon. So we've got to pace ourselves We have to discipline ourselves. We have to talk to ourselves when necessary. We've got to encourage ourselves. And we've got to keep our focus. And so this morning, as a part of the pep talk, right, at the Holy Spirit's direction, I want to give you some things that you can implement that will optimize now in the closing of this dispensation, it will help to optimize our spiritual endurance. It'll help us finish our race well, right? And so, uh, and, and enable us to stand, I suppose, with a sense of confidence on that day. I call them things to keep, things to keep. 
And so the first one, if you're taking notes, it's found in Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, uh, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing that we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience or endurance or steadfastness the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, notice, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Notice verse 2, looking unto Jesus. The first thing I want to encourage you to keep this morning as we're finishing this race, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Any experienced runner or someone that's involved in competitive racing, they will tell you that the moment you take your eyes off the finish line, you take your eyes off the goal. You get distracted by the people around you and the things around you is the very moment that you hinder your ability to run the race successfully. That's why the Bible says, look, you need to keep your eyes on Jesus. Notice it doesn't say keep your eyes on your neighbor or your fellow Christian or church member or family members or co-workers. Why? Because people can be very distracting if we allow them to be. Guys, none of us are perfect. We all have areas that we can work on. But if we're not careful, we will allow ourselves to begin to zero in on the faults and what we perceive to be the faults and inadequacies of other people. And then we can allow their actions to begin to influence our own attitudes and outlook, right? And so that's why the scripture says, look, man, keep your eyes on Jesus. Because I know people that have not entered the doors of a church for 20 years because somebody in the church offended them. Well, look, your eyes are in the wrong place. We got to keep them where they belong. There'll always be distractions along the way. Satan is the master of distraction. Things are going to happen in life. They're going to happen in this world. They're going to happen in our personal life, our church environment, our work environment. But if you and I are going to run this race successfully and finish well, we're going to have to keep our eyes on Jesus. Notice Proverbs 4, 25 through 27 in the Message Bible. It says, keep your eyes straight ahead. Now watch this. Ignore all the sideshow distractions. <laughs> and boy, there's plenty of those in the world right now. Ignore all the sideshow distractions. You and I have a choice as to what we give our attention to. It goes on to say in verse 26, watch your step. Not your neighbor's step. Watch your step. And the road will stretch out smooth before you. Look neither to the right nor the left. Leave evil in the dust. Woo! Now let me read Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 again for you in the Message Bible because it brings a little more clarity. Notice it says, do you see then what this means? All these pioneers who blaze the way, all these veterans of the faith that are looking on. It means we better get on with it. Strip down, start running. That just means get rid of the encumbrances. Never quit. Everybody say never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins, the things that kind of suck the spiritual life out of us. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed, that exhilarating finish in and with God. That's how we should cross this finish line. Not like, <laughs> no man, whoa, we, we ought to finish like this, right? Keeping our eyes on Jesus. He could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in a place of honor. Right alongside God, when you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story again. Item by item, that long litany of hostility that he 
plowed through. That will shoot adrenaline into your souls. Maybe you're here this morning and you can identify with that. Brother Marty, I just feel like sometimes, man, I'm just plowing through life. Plowing week after week, month after month. Well, hey, you're in good company. Jesus had some things he had to plow through. A lot of resistance, some things he had to endure and plow through. You just keep plowing. Keep your head up. Keep your eyes on Jesus. You're going to come to the end of that field, and it will yield an abundant harvest. Are you with me? Everybody say, keep your eyes on Jesus. The second thing I want to encourage you to keep this morning, thinking about the coming reward in this race we're running, is keep your affections on things above. Keep your affections on things above. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.4, notice every soldier called to active duty must divorce himself or separate himself from the distractions of this world so that he may fully satisfy the one who chose him. As we said to you, you know, it's so easy to become entangled and captivated uh, with the affairs of this, this natural life and allow the natural life to infiltrate our minds and our hearts to such a degree that uh, we cease to pursue, right, spiritual things perhaps in the degree that we might uh, should. You're familiar with Colossians chapter 3, uh, 1 through 2. I like to give a lot of scripture because the word can speak for itself. Colossians 3, 1 through 3, if you then be risen with Christ, notice, seek those things that are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Notice, set your affections, your what? Your desires, your pursuit, your love, your mind, set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. For you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now, how many of you have heard the old saying, it's possible to be so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good? But did you know also it's possible to be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good? So what we need to do as believers as we're running this race is bring a balance to life and learn to live proficiently in both realms. And the way that we do that is we prioritize, okay? And so we keep our affections, our love, our pursuit, our desires, now watch this word, primarily on things above. And we don't allow ourselves to be consumed and preoccupied exclusively with the things of the world so that we are no longer pursuing eternal things as we should. Does that make sense? See the balance? So as a Christian, our perspective in life must be an eternal one. This earthly life, as you and I know it, is a fleeting moment in time, in the scope of eternity. The Bible says that our, our earthly existence and this race we're running, it's like a mist that appears for a moment and vanishes away. It's like a shadow that passes, a flower that fades, grass that withers. All of these analogies show the brevity of this life on the planet, right? And so, man, while we're here, we want to keep an eternal perspective. We want to keep our affection on things above. We want to have a proper perspective of this world. And we want to make intelligent decisions based upon that perspective. And so the Apostle John, man, he gives some great insight here. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17 in the Passion Translation. Notice, don't set the affections of your heart on this world or in loving the things of the world. The love of the Father and the love of the world are incompatible. All that the world can offer, the gratification of our flesh, the allurement of the things of the world, the obsession with status and importance, none of these things come from the Father. 
They come from the world. And the world and its desires are in the process of passing away. But those who love to do the will of God live forever. Woo, hallelujah, that's good news for you and I. So how important is it, and particularly now, if you don't know that this dispensation is closing quickly, just open your eyes and look around, right? How important is it, and particularly now, that you and I make our decisions in life based upon the perspective that is set forth in that verse? This world is temporary. This world is passing away. And so, in light of that reality, we need to ask ourselves the appropriate questions about what we're doing in this life and why. So, there's a lot of things we could do. Temporary gratifications, pleasures of sin for a season, and they're pleasurable to the flesh. But once again, as a Christian, I need to make intelligent decisions based on truth. And the truth is, this world and everything in it is temporary. It will pass away except for you and I. From a natural perspective, people are the only eternal things that we come in contact with on this planet. So I want to live my life now and invest my time and my energy and my effort primarily in things that carry eternal value. That's why being a part of a local church like this and serving and loving and communicating and being a blessing, that has eternal value. And you will be rewarded for it. Now listen, we're not implying that we can't enjoy life. Family, friends, hobbies, entertainment, activity. Yes, God wants us to enjoy our lives. But what we're emphasizing is that our primary affections and pursuits should be on things above and all else is secondary. So it's content and preoccupation that we're addressing. So let me read this to you again in 1 John chapter 2. Everybody all right this morning? You like your pep talk? (laughs) Hey, it's good for us. 1 John 2, 15 through 17, watch this. Don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. It's all right to have them. Just don't love them. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. How many of you know you can lose your appetite for things? Right? And the same is true of spiritual things. Whatever we feed most consistently will become the dominant forces in our life. So if we don't feed the right appetites and desires, then we can potentially lose our desire uh, for the things of God and the flesh will seem to dominate. But notice, don't let the love of the world squeeze out love for the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, the things that our physical nature uh, and our eyes crave for, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Him. The world and all of its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. (laughs) But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. Man, hallelujah. That's good news. So, you know, that's where we want our affections primarily. Now, Number one, keep your eyes on Jesus. Number two, keep your affections on things above. And the only way that we're going to be able to keep our affections on things above is if we do number three. And number three is keep your heart with all diligence. Keep your heart with all diligence. Jesus had a lot to say about the heart of man. So guys, I want to read you Two scriptures, and then I'm going to comment pertaining to the heart, okay? The first is in Matthew 12, 35. Notice, a good man out of the good treasure, one translation says the good deposits of his heart, brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure, or the evil deposits of his heart, brings forth evil things. Now let me read you Mark 7, 18 through 23. This is out of the 26 translations. Notice, 
Nothing that goes into a man's mouth from the outside can defile him or make him unclean. Why? Well, because it doesn't reach into his heart. It goes into his stomach and passes out of the body altogether. It is what comes out of a man's heart that pollutes him. For from inside a man's heart come evil thoughts, adultery, theft, murder, jealousy, slander, arrogance, all of these evils issue and proceed from within. Now we understand as a Christian we're a new creation, we've been given a new nature. But the heart of man is where the spirit and soul unite. It is the seat of your person. Okay, and so basically the Bible says, look, the heart of man is like a bank account. Whatever is deposited, that is exactly what will be withdrawn. Your heart and mine is one of the most fertile fields ever created. Whenever a seed is planted in that heart, that seed will germinate. It will grow it will develop and it will release the fruit of that seed into the life, whatever the nature of that seed may be, positive, negative, good, or evil. Sometimes people say to me, Brother Marty, I don't understand myself. My actions, my responses, I fly off the handle. I find myself, I'm a Christian and I start cussing. I've got this stronghold, these imaginations. I don't understand well, I probably do, and the reason is, is because it's a principle that I've taught my little girls from the moment they were able to understand. Garbage in, garbage out, and it's just a law. Whatever I plant into the heart will proceed out of the heart. And so uh, we have to be very cognizant and aware of what we're planting because there are what we call seed distributors. The entrance to the heart is the eye gates, the ear gates, the reflections and the meditations of the mind. All of these are means by which seed is planted, right? And so these distributors, the music we listen to with the lyrics, the movies that we watch, full of profanity, sensuality, violence, and other forms of media. The companionship that we keep. Are you listening? Uh, the thoughts that we allow to linger. All of these, and this is not condemnation. This is life. This is truth. I didn't know this when I was young. I wish I would have. Right? But I learned it. And so all of these are seed dispensers. And did you know the reality is our heart is non-discriminatory where seed is concerned? That's my job. I'm the gatekeeper. So once again, whatever I allow in, right? Whatever seed I allow to be planted, it's going to germinate. It's going to grow. It's going to develop, and it will release, release the fruit of that seed into my life, whether it be positive, negative, or good, or evil. So that's why Proverbs 4.23 tells us. What does it say? Keep your heart with all diligence, because out of it are the issues of life. Right? One translation says, above everything that you guard, guard your heart. Because your heart is the fountain from which your life springs. Amen? So, once again, what we see, what we hear, what we surround ourselves with, the company we keep, all of these things can have a profound impact. And we want to reflect the glory of God. The person of God. And so you might be saying, well, yikes, this morning, you know. Hey, man, I, 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 I planted some bad seed. I've been there before I knew truth. But I got some great news for you. How many of you know the Bible says the word is like water that washes? Right? How many of you know a, 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 a farmer can plant new seed and get a new crop? <laughs> so what you do is you just start inundating yourself with the Word of God. Get a podcast, man. Start listening to the Word. Uh, you know, hear your pastor. Uh, read the Word. Listen to the Word. And what do you do? You just begin to wash 
your heart. Wash your consciousness. And that seed will germinate, grow, and develop. And it will displace all the old. You can take a, 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 you know, you've seen a glass, maybe milk in the bottom, or you got a container and it's kind of dirty in the bottom. You put it under the faucet and you turn that faucet on full blast. What happens? The force of that water displaces, that's a law of physics, what's in the bottom of that glass. The same thing can happen in the heart of man. We can displace the old and bring in the new. All right. So even though we're new creations, we still have to guard our heart. All right. Because it can be contaminated. So John G. Lake said this. He said, if one would be a Christian, I mean a real one, he said, he must close the mind, close the heart, close the being to all that is evil and live with an openness to God only so that the glory of God shines in. But all that is dark is shut out. Now, don't be under condemnation this morning. If you say, well, I need to do some displacement. Well, go ahead and do it. Right? That's good news. All right? Everybody say, keep your heart with all diligence. <laughs> Woo, team. How many of you can take two more? How many give me five more minutes? Anybody? Five, 10, 15, 20, 25. All right. Praise God. Two more. All right. We're talking about finishing this race strong, standing before him, running our race. Amen. Uh, this, the fourth one is found in Jude, verses 20 and 21. But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Notice, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Number four, keep yourself in the love of God. Now, for most of us, that's a full-time job, <laughs> right? But notice in John 13, 34, Jesus made this statement. He said, a new commandment. Notice he didn't say a new suggestion, Right? He said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So it's not a suggestion, it's a command. And so we obey it, as you've been well taught, by choice. Right? We've got natural laws, we've got spiritual laws. Out here on the road, I noticed you've got a speed limit posted. That's a natural law. We obey that speed limit by choice because we know if we don't, that we could suffer the potential consequences. And I must admit, I have uh, ignored and suffered those consequences on occasion. But this law of love is exactly that. And we must obey that law by choice. And, and Jesus gives us, or the Apostle John, uh, gives us some insight in the, into the nature and the character of this kind of love God's talking about. Over in 1 John 4, verse 7, and then also 10 through 11, 1 John 4, 7, and then 10 through 11. Notice, beloved, yes, sir, let's love one another. For love is of God. Everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. Now watch how he describes this love. Verse 10. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. One translation says, first loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Now notice it says not that we love God, but he first loved us. Irrespective initially of our spiritual condition, our rebellion, our response, our faults, our imperfections, he loved us, in a sense, unconditionally, right? And so basically, the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. So the Bible says, look, God said, if I can love you with your imperfections at times, your shortcomings, your self-centeredness or unkind words or deeds, for goodness sake, can't you extend that same love and courtesy and make considerations for the people around you? And isn't that true? None of us are perfect. We've already said that. We're going to make mistakes at times. We're going to react and respond improperly. But God said, look, make allowances for one another. 
extend to others the same love and mercy that you look to me to extend to you. And so in Mark eleven twenty five 25 through 26, I love this passage of Scripture. Jesus talking about forgiveness, you know, in its connection to love, uh, excuse me, to faith and prayer and so forth. He said, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. Let it drop. Leave it. Let it go. In order that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive you of your own failings and shortcomings. And let them drop. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your failings and shortcomings. Good Lord, man. I don't know about you, but I need to be on the mercy end. <laughs> right? And the Bible says, he who gives judgment without mercy will receive judgment without mercy. So I want to I wanna extend mercy. I want to be forgiving. Because if we're not careful, we can allow what the Bible says, roots of bitterness to get down on the inside. How many of you know how a root of bitterness uh, develops? Through reflection. Constantly allowing our thoughts to reflect how dare you treat me like that? What you said. How you treated me. You know, and we reflect and we rehearse until the seed goes down into the heart. And then the fruit of bitterness springs up. And Hebrews chapter 12 says, man, it starts defiling us. Right? Emotionally, mentally, relationally, physically. Right? And so we have to, to be careful of that. And then it says it'll begin to defile the people around us because it just comes out, right? And, and, you know, listen, all of us have situations and circumstances in life. Uh, you know, I was 18 years old. I was raised Southern Baptist, 18. I went to a Bible study, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that was the summer before I went off to college, so I go on, off to college in Alabama, uh, a freshman. We had three of us in a room, so I had two roommates. So both my roommates were out of the room. So I said, oh, man, I was so excited on fire. You know, I, was, I said, I'm going to pray in the Spirit. I'm going to worship God. So I got down to pray in other tongues, and I was just worshiping God. And all of a sudden, I'm in the Spirit, and I have a vision. And listen, I'd never had anything like that but my eyes are closed I'm seeing in the realm of the spirit and all of a sudden this huge file cabinet appeared before me and you know how on the outside those drawers are labeled alphabetically sometimes categorically on a file cabinet all of a sudden here's this massive file cabinet and the vision it scrolls down to the bottom drawer and on the bottom was written the word unforgiveness and this huge hand came and opened that drawer. And when it did, out popped the head of my dad. Now, I don't mean this respect, disrespectfully to my dad. My dad's in heaven. He's a precious man. And I'll tell you the story. But out popped the head of my dad. And the Lord said, you have unforgiveness against your father. And you need to let it go. Well, you know, growing up, my dad was, a, he was a, a wonderful person in the sense that he was kind of the life of the party. Man, everybody knew Mr. Black Welder. When he came into a room, it was just, he, he could work the room. He was an, an exceptional business person. And he was good in the sense he was a wonderful provider. But my dad was raised by two alcoholic parents. He was abused in a sense verbally and physically at times growing up. And so he had an anger issue. And I mean, you never knew when, it, when he was going to get set off. And if he did get set off, you better run. You better run to your room, mama, sister, me included, because you wanted to get out of there. So I grew up in my early years walking on eggshells, tents, you don't want to set daddy off. Now, he was affectionate. He loved you. But it could flip. See what I'm saying? And I resented it. And I resented the way he treated my mom at times as a son. So, man, I, I just pushed it down. I didn't really realize. 
But when the Lord brought that up, man, I, I released my father that day. I let it go. I said, oh, I love my dad. Father, I forgive him. And I, I was weeping, you know. Little did I know that it would affect my spiritual life in a positive way. But it also released my father. And I started praying for my dad. And God is my witness. About a year later, I was home in the summertime from college. My dad came home weeping uncontrollably. And I said, Dad, what, what's going on? He took my mother in his arms and was crying and said, forgive me, forgive me. He said, I was sitting in my office and I, I had a vision. He said, my whole life opened before me as a curtain. And I saw myself as I really am. And <laughs> it changed his whole life. He was gloriously, you know, I say saved. My dad was probably saved, but he was just, you know, hurt too. When you see where other people have come from, you have more compassion. Because they have a past too. And my dad, after that, man, he finally got baptized in the Holy Ghost. He was so precious. Forty years of his life. I mean, he would cry at the blessing at Thanksgiving. I'm saying, Dad, this is the prayer. This is the blessing. I know. <laughs> you know, he was so tender and so precious, you know. So praise God. Everybody say, let it go. Let it drop. All right, I don't mean to talk years off. But here's the last one now. Well, let me give you this scripture. 1 Corinthians 14, 1. It says, go after a life of love as if your life depended on it. Because it does. Daryl Copes, he used to travel with us. He was a bass player. He'd say, flesh is flesh no matter whose bones it's on. Right? We've all got it. But you know what we're going to do in 2022 starting this morning and, and till Jesus comes? We're going to walk in love. We're going to forgive the people that have hurt us and wounded us, right? And we're going to be a blessing. So here's the fifth one. Number one was keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your affection on things above. Keep your heart with all diligence. Keep yourself in the love of God. And number five, keep on keeping on. Come on, let's finish this thing strong, right? Keep on keeping on. Galatians 6, 9 says, let's not grow weary in well-doing. Or in doing good, for in due season we'll reap if you do not lose a heart. We've got a race to run, guys. We've got a course to finish. We've got good works to accomplish. Let's let our testimony be the same as the Apostle Paul's in 1 Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy, excuse me, chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. Notice his testimony. I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. And finally, that's what we're going to say. Whoo, finally, there's laid up for me <laughs> a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at that day and not to me only, but to all those who love is appearing. A crown is a symbol of honor. It's the emblem of a champion. It denotes a place of Dominion and rulership. That's the place that he's prepared for us. But guess what, man? We got to run. We got to run to win. First Corinthians chapter 9. Look at here. 24 and 25. Paul said, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs? But only one person gets the prize. So this is the attitude with which we run. Run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. We do it to win an eternal prize. The King James says, an incorruptible crown. Thank God for the blessings of the here and now, but nothing's going to compare to that day when Jesus comes and we stand before him and he gives you that incorruptible crown, that crown of righteousness. It's going to be a glorious day. But we got to contend for it, friends. If you don't know, the world is trying to draw people away from God and from the body of Christ and from participating in church and being a part of, and a vital part of the body of Christ in the earth. And so Jesus said these words, Revelation 3.11. Notice what he said. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have. That no one may take your crown. 
Don't let the devil take it. Don't let the flesh take it. Don't let unforgiveness and bitterness take it. Don't let personal discouragement or disappointment take it. Right? Come on. Let's forget yesterday. Let's run the last leg of this race with tremendous determination. Are you with me? I want to leave you with this this morning. This is my last scripture. It's kind of a combination of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 3. 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 3. And also 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Uh, but I wanted to read it out of, out of this translation. So it says, be strong in the grace. It's not about our ability exclusively. Oh, I'm going to will to do it. It's about his ability infused into us to help us. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Watch this. Stand firm, unyielding, unrelenting, determined, and secure. Live your lives with an unshakable confidence, knowing that you prosper and excel in every season by serving the Lord. And your union with the Lord will make your labor productive with fruit that endures. Whether you're in the ministry, whether you're a layman serving in the church, whether you're a housewife, employer, employee, whatever facet of life you and I may find ourselves in, let's let our light shine. Let's live for Jesus. Let's run our race well and let's finish strong. Can anybody say amen? So here's what I want you to do, if you don't mind. I want you to say, I will run my race. I will finish my course. I will keep my eyes on Jesus. And you can put that up there for them, uh, Patrick. I'll keep my eyes on Jesus. I'll keep my affection on things above. I'll keep my heart with all diligence. I'll keep myself in the love of God. And I'll keep on keeping on. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody shout glory. Now that might have been a little different pep talk. But guys, I'm convinced Jesus is coming. And uh, we want to live our lives like that's a reality. So when you go home today, don't forget these words. Rehearse them. Keep them in your heart and mind. Uh, Patrick, if you'll start that uh, CD just for a moment, that MP3. Guys, let's close our eyes for a moment. I just want to wait on the Lord if you don't mind. Give me just a little bit more volume of that. Just listen. We all live this life. We all encounter different things. Different battles we fight different situations we face. As you're sitting in that chair right now, I just want to give you a moment for introspection, so to speak, reflection. If there's some conversation you want to have with the Lord, maybe you say, man, I, I just haven't guarded my heart as I should. I've been opening up to things that are not good. Well, you can just make your amends there. And pledge to do a better job and ask God to help you. Maybe there's some uh, offense. People have earnestly hurt you and that can happen and you need to let it go. We'll just do that. It doesn't take a vision an emotion. You can just say I forgive. So just take a moment there. Whatever you may need to talk to him about, you do it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. You know, when we say walking in love, it doesn't mean you have to be someone's doormat or stay in an abusive situation. Or entrust yourself to someone who isn't trustworthy. But it does mean that you have to forgive them from your heart.
so that it doesn't affect you and it releases them. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We give you praise. Thank you, Jesus. You know, the Lord speaks to me many times in psalms, hymns, spiritual psalms. You know, in, in company with this word this morning, the word of the Lord came to me uh, not, not too distant past, and I believe He'll bring it back up in my spirit. But he said, the gathering of the saints is drawing near. So open your heart and be attentive and hear. For this race that you're running, it carries eternal glory and weight. And your reward will be waiting the day that you enter heaven's gate. So, lay aside every encumbrance and set your affection on things above. And keep your heart with all diligence and walk in a spirit of love. And run the race that's set before you with great passion and zeal and determined intent. So that the day you stand before me, you will be found faithful and will have accomplished that for which you were born and that for which you were sent. And so keep your eyes intently upon me in the days ahead and listen carefully to my spirit and endeavor to be led so that your steps will be ordered and your path might be made secure and fight the good fight of faith and remain steadfast and endure. And so you will receive the crown of righteousness on that day. And when you look upon the face of Him who has redeemed you, You'll hear him say, well done. Well done, my faithful daughter. Well done, my faithful son. Well done. Father, we love you today. We thank you, Lord. And we do honor you. And we do believe that you're coming soon, Lord Jesus. And we want to live our lives in accordance with with your word and your life and your light. And we look so forward to seeing you. Thank you, Jesus.